by the late 1880s, um, Euro-American uh, white people, in other words, uh, and, and other groups who were American citizens uh, outnumbered Native Americans in every area. Uh, even in Minnesota and Oklahoma. Yes, Oklahoma, which at that point was still called Indian Territory. There were more white people than there were Indians. And also, as we saw by the late 1880s, even the Chiricahua Apaches had been defeated, uh, had been, uh, in essence, as L. Frank Baum would have put it, conquered. So... Um, what's going to happen now uh, with the people and, more importantly, with the land? Because that's really what it was all about, wasn't it? Well, um, the groundwork started to be laid for, for that as early as 1871 when Congress uh, passed a law that effectively ended the treaty era. If you, uh, if you go back and you look at the list of treaties that have been made with American Indian nations, you won't see any past 1871 at all. Uh, the law read, quote, provided that hereafter no Indian nation or tribe within the territory of the United States shall be acknowledged or recognized as an independent nation, tribe, or power with whom the United States may contract by treaty. The treaty era started for the United States of America in 1776, when they first started having treaties with Indian tribes, specifically trying to get uh, Indian allies in their fight against the English. But as time went on and the power of the tribes diminished, and the power of the United States grew decade by decade, things started to change. By the 1830s, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, Native American tribes were, quote, domestic dependent nations uh, and were wards of the state. However, this law essentially said they're not any kind of nation. They're not any kind of tribe. They are essentially, from that point forward, to be viewed as uh, as people living uh, within the uh, boundaries of the United States, and that was it. Now, uh, it would be several years even after this, as we saw with the story of Standing Bear, before they were legally recognized as even being human beings. As we've seen already, part of the plan for Native people by the late 1870s was to Americanize them, to kill the Indian, to save the man. Now, the relationship between the native people and the land was going to become a part of this process. Enter this guy, the pioneering American anthropologist, Lewis Henry Morgan, whose work was cited by uh, Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, and Sigmund Freud. So he was an influential individual. In fact, uh, in the early, late, late 1860s, early 1870s, he had, uh, he had worked with U.S. Grant and Eli Parker to craft Grant's Indian policy. Morgan's magnum opus was the 1877 book, Ancient Society, uh, in which he applied this, uh, this idea uh, of social evolution. He proposed that there were basically three stages that every culture went through um, from, all, from all around the world, all through time. Three stages that were like a, a, a ladder. So the evolution was going from stage one to stage two to stage three. Those three stages were savagery, barbarism, and civilization. And the distinguishing mark between those or among those, those three stages was property, views of property. So that uh, essentially in 
in Morgan's scenario, savages have no property. Barbarians have communal property, and civilized people have individual property. Uh, he said, quote, when communities change their property practices, they move up the evolutionary ladder. Individual property is the bridge between savagery and civilization. So this was a, uh, this was a very influential work, and it articulated ideas that had already kind of been uh, floating around. Uh, the idea that uh, Native people in particular were, were uncivilized because they had no concept of property, which is not true. They, had, they did not have the European concept of property. And that idea had been promulgated uh, ever since shortly uh, after the time of uh, Christopher Columbus as an excuse to take land from Native people. There was more of a, more of a move among um, uh, intellectuals in the United States, intellectuals and also policymakers, that in order to become civilized, in order to become Americanized, Native people had to abandon the barbaric idea of tribal communal ownership of land and move up the evolutionary ladder to individual ownership, which was the Jeffersonian agrarian ideal from the uh, early, uh, early years of this country. Thomas Jefferson's idea that the small independent yeoman farmer is the backbone of America and is the ultimate expression of freedom and democracy with the idea that every family should have their own farm. Well, that should be applied to Native Americans as well. Instead of having that uh, traditional idea of, you know, having uh, doing agriculture by having one big field that everyone works in and everyone shares in, uh, have individual farms. And this is going to involve the uh, proper application of gender roles. Men should be outside doing the farming earning their living by the sweat of their brow, uh, whereas women should be inside where they belong doing domestic work. Now, this idea was, uh, was being promoted uh, as early as the administration of George Washington. But now, now there's a, there's a concrete goal to work toward. That goal is allotment. So that in order for the tribes, well, for the individuals who were members at that time of tribes, which are no longer recognized by Congress as independent, um, that land needs to be divided up and not be communally owned by the tribe, but be individually owned by members of the tribe. So people started proposing the idea of taking these reservations and dividing them into lots, hence allotment, with uh, uh, 200 acre tracts, every uh, Native American family to have one tract so that each family would have their own farm. Now, uh, as an example, let's take the uh, Crow tribe of Montana. They were living on a reservation that had 5 million acres communally held by the tribe. So 3,000 crows, if, if each individual member of the crow tribe, not, not each family, but even just each individual, to make the math easier, it doesn't sound like that. Um, if they each got 200 acres, that's still only 600,000 acres out of a 5 million acre reservation, which means there will be 4.4 million acres left over. So, uh, gee... What's going to happen to all of that land if it is not being held as farms by individual crows and or their families? Why, all that surplus land left over after such allotment would become public land. Public, of course, meaning that it belongs to the people, but what it really means in this context is 
it belongs to the federal government. And as such, that public government land could then be made available to American citizens to be used, to be developed. Then enter this guy, Henry Dawes, Republican senator from Massachusetts. Turns out that uh, turns out that white guys named Henry with big beards and high foreheads were generally just bad news for Native Americans in the late 19th century. Anyway, this idea of allotment had been uh, bandied about. It had been promoted. It had been discussed uh, since the 1870s. Dawes. Uh, entered into a, uh, a, a campaign to uh, get support for the idea and entered it in as a bill in the Senate, um, hoping to make, it, to make it law. So here was his plan uh, about allotment. Do it gradually, not all at once. Give every family two years to choose a tract of land. And if they had not chosen one at the end of that time, one would be assigned to them. 160 acres for each head of household, 80 acres for each other adult in, in the family, 40 acres for each child. And the surplus land would be bought by the federal government. And that only if tribal leaders agreed to it. Also, his proposal was that all of these allottees would then become American citizens. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, um, that's not how it happened. That was his initial plan when he introduced the idea. By the time it actually uh, went through, a lot of changes had been made. Uh, for example, the, uh, the idea of the federal government actually paying uh, for the land only if tribal leaders agreed, that's out the window. Surplus land is surplus land. Uh, the idea about the Native uh, Americans then becoming American citizens that also is, is out the window. And the idea of doing it gradually, that, that was done, but not as gradually as, as he had intended. And for the most part, the gradual part of the process was, was mostly because of uh, logistics. The law was passed, the General Allotment Act, alias the Dawes Act, and went into effect in February of 1887. Now, it did not apply to all American Indian tribes because the goal was to, was to civilize the quote-unquote savage. Therefore, with that being, that being the goal, it seemed a little odd to apply it to those tribes that were already being referred to as the civilized tribes, meaning the five quote-unquote civilized tribes originally from the South who had been removed in the Trail of Tears, the... Uh, Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws, Chickasaws, and Seminoles, as well as the, uh, the tribes that uh, uh, were still uh, numerous in, in New York, for example, like the, uh, the Iroquois. They were exempt from this. In 1893, when Dawes left the Senate, not, uh, uh, not continuing on for another term, he, uh, he became head of what was called the Dawes Commission. It was, uh, I guess, officially called the Commission to the Five Civilized Tribes, in which um, he and others tried to uh, negotiate with those five tribes and, and get them to voluntarily submit to allotment. Uh, and that didn't work because they didn't want to do that. Finally, in 1898, Congress uh, passed an addition, a rider to the Dawes Act called the Curtis Act that extended it over all the American Indian tribes, including the five civilized tribes, and then their tribal governments were discorporated. That's part of what this did. Okay, it didn't only divide up the land and uh, distribute it by family. It also ended tribal governments. Well, um, settlers who were uh, wanting to get into these, these areas uh, immediately started pushing their congressmen, whoever they might have happened to be, to speed up the process and make it go faster. 
Um, some small tribes weren't that uh, weren't that hurt by this, and and they weren't that upset by it. If you were a small tribe on a small reservation, and everything was divided up by lot, uh, if it turned out that the amount of land that those allotments took up was roughly equal to the amount of land you had, you're not losing anything. Um, so that was actually a way to then guarantee they could hold on to their land. But that was only true for a handful of tribes. For most tribes, that was not the case. And this was going to end up in a lot of loss of land. And pretty quickly, that surplus land started being offered up by the U.S. government for, for settlement, beginning with the lands in western Oklahoma, Oklahoma Territory, it was called by that time, uh, that had big land rushes uh, where people would come and they would, have, they would have races to see who could get out and claim the best land first. Uh, and that continued as different uh, various tribes had their land allotted and then opened up until finally the uh, the five civilized tribes in eastern Oklahoma had the same thing happen to them. Now, bear in mind that in addition to the lands lost by the tribes uh, in this whole surplus land thing, there was another factor, right? Because the goal is to get Indians to think individually their individual property rights. So if this land is allotted to a Native American family, they can do whatever they want to with it, including if they choose, sell it to anybody that they want to sell it to. Well, these reservations were generally pretty poor places. So a lot of, uh, a lot of Native families did in fact sell the land that was allotted to them, to um, to non-Indians, uh, which led to them to the tribes losing even more of their land. Now later on, and we'll get to this uh, later on. This whole thing gets reversed in the uh, the nineteen thirties, but uh, for those uh, parcels of land that had been sold to non-Indians, that couldn't be reversed, uh, which is why. Still today, if you go onto uh, reservations around the country, there are little pockets, little squares of land inside the reservation that are not owned by the tribe, but are owned by individual non-Indians. Pictured here is a screenshot from, uh, from a movie about the 1889 Oklahoma land rush, which uh, is not an exaggeration, uh, especially in that uh, 1889 opening up of lands in, uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, they literally fired a starting gun, uh, and it was a race for people to get out and claim their spot of land. Some other effects, though, beyond the loss of land. Uh, for one thing, because this also uh, involved a loss of tribal government and tribal negotiating, individual landowners now uh, who were members of the, well, members of what used to be called the tribe, uh, those individual native landowners could negotiate separately with, with industry, with particularly um, the uh, timber industry getting logging rights um, and uh, commercial fisheries along the uh, uh, the coast for those those tribes uh, dealing with individuals to get uh, fishing rights off the coasts of uh, of their land holdings, and so that was further incursion. Another another side effect is uh, a big shift, an even bigger shift in gender roles. Now, seventy five percent of tribes were matrilineal. We've talked about that. Before and in matrilineal societies, even in some patrilineal societies, uh, native societies, women have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of prestige and a lot of uh, a lot of rights that uh, uh, white American women, for example, didn't have at that time. Uh, 
And so for a hundred years already, the government had been trying to get them to get out of that, uh, that uncivilized notion of, uh, you know, giving authority and responsibility to women. So now with this allotment thing, the land is officially going out to the head of household and the head of household, the, the ultimate owner of it all was of course the man. Even, uh, even in those societies that uh, were more egalitarian and had more of a, a division of spheres of influence. So that was, that was an issue. Another issue is these are tribal people. And as tribal people, they tended to live together in communities. And their whole social life was built around that uh, close-knit community idea but now they're being redistributed to these individual farms, multi multiple acre farms, in which instead of being in a village, you are now on an isolated farm and you know you're you may not have a, a neighbor in sight. You probably don't. You have to travel a little ways to get to your neighbor. And that had some uh, some cultural effects, uh, a feeling of alienation, an intense feeling of loneliness and being disconnected from the community. Also, at the same time that uh, this was being enforced, part of it, part of the act included the suppression of Native American culture. It was with the implementation of the Dawes Act, for example, that those uh, boarding schools became mandatory, that the government could just come in and whether you wanted it or not, take your kids away and send them to these boarding schools where they would essentially have the Indian killed out of them uh, by having their, their culture erased as much as possible. And even on the reservation, people were no longer allowed to practice their traditional rituals and ceremonies, uh, not even allowed to wear their ceremonial garb, all in an effort to make them more Americanized. So this was a lot of changes all the way across the board beyond just the, uh, the loss of land. 